Well, welcome everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, just as a reminder, this will be recorded today. Um, welcome to the School of Education Doctoral Student Colloquium Series presentation. I am Kristen Kosky and I'm going to be the faculty uh, moderator this afternoon. We're so pleased to welcome all of our virtual attendees, including School of Education faculty, staff, and students, the university body at large, community members, and partner associations, among others. The doctoral colloquium series um, offered in the School of Education is for doctoral students, and it gives them an opportunity to share their original research and learn from their peers, faculty, and staff. Each month, one EDD and one PhD student presents their research at the colloquium. We are happy to offer this colloquium through Zoom during the 22 to 23 academic year. These sessions help doctoral students to connect with each other and develop a peer community that is invaluable to supporting their journeys in the program. Each doctoral student presenter is also asked to write a research brief that relates to his or her presentation, which is then included in an edited publication titled Doctoral Student Research Briefs, published on the School of Education's website. The research brief is a way to disseminate our doctoral students' research as shared in the colloquium in a concise format with relevance to education. Each presenter today will be provided 20 minutes to share his or her research. We will then move to questions and answers following each presentation. So I ask if you just please save your questions for the end of each presentation and I'll prompt um, a time that you can ask those. You're also welcome to type your questions at the end of each presentation in the chair area of Zoom or use your mic to ask a question, whichever you prefer. All right, without further ado, our first speaker is Miss Monica Blaisdell, who is a second year PhD student in Drexel University School of Education. Originally from Syracuse, New York, Monica holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Philosophy, Politics, and Law, and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Environmental Public Policy from Bingham University. She also holds a Master of Science degree in Environmental Science from the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry, where her research focused on the sustainability of local food systems in Onondaga County. After her master's program, she remained at Sunny ESF as an academic advisor and curriculum coordinator for several years, where her work with students inspired her to explore the role of education in empowering people to lead full, civically engaged, environmentally responsible lives. Her current research center around how young people build and sustain individual and collective efficacy for climate action. Today, Monica will be speaking about global citizenship, pro-environmental behavior, and moral development, an integrative literature review. So Monica, I'll go ahead and close my mic down so that you can share your screen. Great. Thank you so much for the warm introduction, Dr. Kosky. Hoping this will be a seamless screen sharing process. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Awesome. Okay. So as Dr. Kosky said, the title of my presentation today is Global Citizenship, Pro-Environmental Behavior, and World Development, an Integrative Literature Review. So before I provide background on this study, I wanted to begin by defining the three major concepts integrated in this literature review. To begin with, I have global citizenship, which the United Nations defines as the development of knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes needed for social, political, and economic actions of globally-minded individuals and communities on a worldwide scale. Pro-environmental behavior is defined as one's conscious actions that seek to lessen the harmful impacts brought upon the natural environment. And moral development in this paper is defined as the formation of an individual's concepts of right and wrong, conscience, ethical values, social attitudes, and behavior. So why are these three concepts being integrated for the purposes of my literature review? Over the past several decades, the world has been experiencing a diverse array of global challenges, including a decline in various levels of civic engagement, increase in global inequalities, prevalence of environmental and climate-related dangers, 
and perceived lack of pro-social response to global issues, just to name a few. To respond to these challenges, scholars and activists alike have developed the concept of global citizenship, which was formally adopted by all member states of the United Nations at the 2005 World Summit. To contribute to the education of global citizens, the United Nations has established a global citizenship agenda called Global Citizenship Education that highlights education's role in developing the knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes that learners need to become actively involved in building peaceful and secure societies at local and global levels. Given this diverse array of global challenges that exist, the definition of global citizenship is itself contested and continuously evolving to meet the needs of its global citizens and contexts. One of these rapidly evolving global challenges is that of climate change or human induced shifts in weather patterns that lead to environmental degradation. Climate change is a borderless, wicked problem that requires a reorientation of one's mindset about their place and role in the world. The latest report by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change declared that anthropogenic actions have significantly raised global temperatures, which, if raised an additional 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2040, as projected, will cause unavoidable increases in multiple climate hazards and risks to ecosystems and humans. This is merely the most recent and a consistent outpouring of reports from the scientific community since the 1970s, cautioning about the impacts of human-induced climate change, which has propelled forward the concept of sustainability both into popular discourse and into education. Scientists and scholars have thus called for environmental education as a launching pad to inspire pro-environmental behavior and action. And so in addition to this concern over global environmental challenges, scholars have also expressed a need for reinvigorated moral education in the 21st century to guide students toward developing strong values and making responsible decisions in their lives, which in an increasingly globalized world requires a global lens on values and actions. Moral education often falls under the umbrella of character education, which aims to instill dispositional tendencies of behavior in young people. The terms morals, values, ethics, character have thus been used interchangeably in the literature to signal the development of a foundation for pro-social dispositions of individuals. As moral dispositions form the prerequisite for social or pro-social behavior, it stands to reason that the evolution from moral development to pro-social behavior will include behaviors focused on the environment at a global scale. So altogether, we're seeing three related concepts focused on attitudinal or action-oriented dispositions that function at a global or universal scale and which reference education as a necessary response. The consideration of these three elements together forms the vision for the Integrative Literature Review. And so research has acknowledged the moral dimensions of global citizenship. It's also acknowledged the environmental realities that necessitate global citizenship education, but we really lack an integrative exploration of the conceptual, empirical, programmatic interplay between these three elements as global concepts with educational implications. And given the contested definitions of global citizenship paired with vague associations in the literature between these three elements, it's really important to draw linkages and understand their interplay to really respond to civic, environmental, and moral challenges of the 21st century holistically. Without this integrated understanding of complex global education issues, the field of education will lack the full scope of what is really needed to cultivate compassionate, environmentally active global citizens, which may prevent the activation of the next generation of global change makers in the achievement of global education agendas. So the purpose of this integrative literature review was to explore how scholars situate and conceptualize the relationship between global citizenship, pro-environmental behavior, and moral development. So the interdisciplinary scholars can really link together their research to address these complex global issues. So my research question for this review is how do scholars situate and conceptualize the relationship between global citizenship, pro-environmental behavior, and moral development? 
How did I go about conducting this literature review? I used Taraco's integrative literature review protocol. Taraco characterizes an integrative literature review as a work that reviews, critiques, and synthesizes representative literature on a topic in an integrated way such that new frameworks and perspectives on the topic are generated. To review and synthesize the conceptualizations of the interplay between global citizenship, environmentalism, and moral development, I exhaustively searched combinations of the following four groupings of words. I had global citizenship, education, environmental behavior slash environmental action, and moral slash ethics slash character slash pro-social. Environmental behavior and environmental action were both used to absorb articles that discussed an active component of environmentalism, while moral, ethic, character, and pro-social were all used um, to follow the framework of Christensen and her inclusive and exhaustive understanding of moral development, where she included these words herself. Additionally, given that this is such a specific intersection, um, I aimed to be more inclusive of terminology, especially when it came to moral development, where there are lots of words out there used to describe it. In terms of selection criteria for the articles, I limited my search to articles written within the last 10 years. But other than that, again, to try to capture articles written about this really specific intersection, I was inclusive of all article types, which followed loosely a protocol by Bird. Um, I included all levels of the PK-20 education sequence, as these are all really complex and enduring educational phenomena that um, I was interested in exploring um, how different scholars situate their intersection at all points along the educational continuum. And all articles had to contain each of these three elements in either their abstract title keywords or in a search of the documents, which proved to be a very long and um, rigorous process. <laughs> So after considering these criteria and eliminating any redundancies of articles after the multiple waves of searches, I read through each article in its entirety um, and explored the conceptual interplay between the three elements. And then finally, I loosely adapted Burke's integrative literature review protocol by separating articles by relationship rather than chronology into four different groups, conceptual, empirical, intervention, and discipline-specific hybrid. The conceptual papers were those that spoke exclusively to theoretical relationships between the concepts. Empirical articles um, explored the relationship between the concepts. Interventions actually administered interventions to examine impacts of these concepts on certain outcomes. And then the discipline-specific hybrids were those with a combination of theoretical, empirical, and intervention-related work, which all happened to be discipline-specific papers. So in total, I reviewed 30 papers, a third of them were conceptual, um, just over a third were empirical, and just under a third were a combination of intervention and discipline specific hybrid. So relatively even split between the first two and um, one third of the final two. So um, what did I find by category? Um, there were 11 empirical papers in this review that integrated global citizenship, pro-environmental behavior, and world development, but there were differences in terms of which components were emphasized and why. In particular, there was a delineation between articles that centralized pro-environmental behavior versus those that centralized moral development. Several studies focused on the impact of the variables of global citizenship and moral attributes on environmental behavior, where discrepancies then lied in the primacy, or lack thereof, of morality and global citizenship in relation to other variables, like knowledge, access, self-efficacy, et cetera. The articles that centralized moral development either focused on how morality is cultivated for civic environmental ends, or aimed to identify the composition of certain moral attributes in students and teachers. Next, we have intervention papers. Um, these four papers all attempted to examine the impact of a course or program on outcomes that integrate these three concepts. Um, three articles found that curricula that include global citizenship, pro-environmental behavior, and moral development are effective at promoting socially aware and environmentally active global citizens, while the fourth focused on a specific instructional technique that resulted in what they deemed socio-moral outcomes. So in both the empirical and intervention papers, as you would expect, outcomes were of primary importance to the authors. 
Next, there were 10 conceptual papers in the review that theorized the interplay between global development or global citizenship, pro environmental behavior, and moral development. Um, the differences between these articles primarily revolved around the points of emphasis or centralization of certain um, concepts over others. Two articles focused on pro-environmental behavior over the other two concepts, three focused on global citizenship, while the remaining five had a relatively even interplay. Finally, five studies focused on how specific disciplines or subjects promoted an integrated framework of learning that embodies global citizenship, um, environmental behavior, and um, moral development. One of these studies undertook an empirical conceptual project that developed and reviewed undergraduate programming in parks and recreation. Three explored business and undergraduate programming. And a fifth explored financial literacy for early childhood. So both the conceptual and discipline specific papers were generally more focused on highlighting dynamics between the three elements um, than something like outcomes, which again is something you would expect from these types of papers. So moving beyond what I found for each of the specific groupings of papers, what were my overall findings from this literature review? What I found was that many articles focused on the relationship between the three components, primarily to understand the way that their dynamics impact environmental behavior. So um, a lot of articles were really trying to understand the role of global citizenship combined with the role of a moral attribute cultivation on pro-environmental behavior, which indicated to a certain extent the perspective of instrumentality of global citizenship and moral attributes in the quest for environmental stewardship, essentially using them as a means to the end that is pro-environmental behavior. I say that future research should identify the specific groupings of moral attributes and global citizenship characteristics that are vital for environmental behavior if we want to then dig a little bit further and understand um, exactly what elements of these two components are necessary for pro-environmental behavior. My second finding was that while moral dimensions are deemed an integral aspect of education, the process from moral attribute cultivation to environmental action is contested in the literature. So some of the articles asserted that development of moral ethical dispositions is a prerequisite toward engaged citizenship and environmental behavior, while others argued that civic engagement and environmental activism result in moral development or cultivation of global citizens. So this contestation between cause and effect among global citizenship environmental behavior and moral development is worth future exploration or future exploration. I suggest that future research investigates and identifies that activation point between moral dispositions and global environmental action to more fully understand what must happen in our educational spaces to translate this capacity, this moral capacity into environmental outcomes. And finally, finding three, global citizenship is either conflated with moral or environmental behavior in the literature, confirming previous assertions about global citizenship's ambiguity, or it's framed as a broader ideal with moral dispositions as components of good citizenship and environmental behavior a result of it. So this really just highlights the complex and context dependent relationship between global citizenship, environmental behavior, and moral components. And I suggest that future research explores in what contexts moral development and global citizenship is most or least prioritized in relation to environmental action and why. Okay, so this paper, in summary, reviewed literature that integrated global citizenship, pro-environmental behavior, and moral development to illustrate how scholars conceptualize their interrelationship. By gaining a sense of the literature in this space, both that and how these components relate in an educational context, both scholars and practitioners can study and implement programming around their holistic relationships in classroom spaces to cultivate global change makers of the 21st century. And so what's next for me here? Um, this was a, court, uh, a paper that I wrote um, for a course that I would really like to build out and consider for a publication. 
So a main um, aspect of that is expanding the scope of literature, um, doing a current review, maybe including an additional database. There are different ways of going about expanding this, but I am very interested in turning it into a publishable work. Um, and I'm also very interested in the um, future research implication from my second finding and really exploring that activation point between moral dispositions and global environmental actions. So we shall see what, what comes to fruition. <laughs> and that is all I have for you. Thank you for listening to me. Um, and if anyone wants to chat about this topic, I left my email up here um, and happy, happy to conversate. Thank you so much, Monica, for sharing your research. At this point, we'll take questions for Monica from our attendees. You're welcome again to um, post these in the chat, which I'm looking for now, or just to unmic and, and ask your question. So I'll just do a pause here to see if there's any questions. Hi, Monica, great presentation. Um, <clears throat> I had a quick question about, um, a kind of how you thought about moral development and some of the theories um, that you kind of underpinned your research with in relation to indigenous people um, and populations that um, you know may have different ways of, of viewing your work. Um, I just wanted to kind of see how you um, kind of synthesize that in your mind as you were going through the literature. Thank you for that question, Terea, and I'm glad you asked it because I think the word or the phrase moral development um, is a complicated one, and I think it's impossible not to have like normative implications maybe associated with it. And so my approach to, to using the phrase moral development was to not necessarily attach any sort of normative component to it, but rather um, allow for a context dependent interpretation of what moral development will mean um, by context, by culture, um, but really just symbolize that the consideration of morals is important in this building out of a global citizen that is fluid through context, through culture um, in that sense. So yeah, not one specific, um, not one specific like doctrine of morality was used at all. So I guess a follow-up question would then be, um, so much of the literature, I guess, is looking through a, a certain lens. Um, so how, I mean, I understand kind of looking at it glo uh, globally and fluidly, but how do you then allow for, I guess, different lenses to show through then. So there's there's a balance there, right? So there's the Western lens that we kind of look through. And then there's, you know, kind of different voices that aren't always amplified. So how do you allow the both and? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I think, so at least in the articles that I reviewed, and I've also like reviewed moral development related literature in other spaces, looking at, you know, the um, like cognitive approach to moral development, like Kohlberg's moral development versus sociocultural approaches to moral development that are very context dependent and socially mediated. Um, I think for this particular paper, there um, probably worth noting was not a lot of discussion about, um, about how to navigate that fluidity that's needed. Um, it was very much just a conversation of morality needing to be present without assigning any sort of definition to what that looks like. Um, and so I think um, this review itself was like a more like overarching, like macro scale consideration of what should be included in the conversation, kind of providing like a roadmap for then those who are implementing programming to make sure that the way that they're defining that is culturally appropriate um, and fluid. Thank you, Terea, for your question. Um, we have time for one more question, if there's another one. Um, I have a question. I was wondering, uh, I noted when you said you had found a couple of business articles, and I was wondering um, how, those business articles you found frame the interplay of your three concepts? Oh, thank you for that question, Tiffany. Um, so yeah, I was actually very surprised with um, how most of the discipline specific articles were in the business space. And there was actually kind of a, um, 
like a debate existing between those who framed their relationship um, through the lens of neoliberalism. There were a couple articles really looking to understand their integration as it relates to like capitalistic ends. And then there were a couple that were really looking to upend um, business philosophy as it stands and really look for restructuring business um, to account for socio-environmental costs as part of a business model. And so I didn't put that as a finding here because I don't know that I know enough about business theory to speak to like some of those nuances, but I did think it was really interesting that there was that debate happening um, in an educational context. And so definitely something worth exploring more in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Tiffany. Okay, if we have time at the end, we can open it up for further questions. Um, our second speaker is Dr. Sam Ramatowski, who holds a BS in psychology from Stevenson University, a MS in school counseling, and a PMC in clinical mental health counseling from John Hopkins University, and an EDD in educational leadership and management from Drexel University. He has served as a middle school and high school counselor for the past nine years, Currently, Sam is the English Learner Family Partnership Specialist for a public school division in Virginia. Today, he will be speaking about the influence of the COVID-19 pandemic on stress in students enrolled in academic advanced academic courses, a multiple case study. And Sam, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having me today. Give me one second to get my screen. I have 10,000 tabs open let's see if that's the right one okay perfect then let me move that expand into that come on perfect okay Good. all right so let me start my timer so i can keep track of my time and go ahead and get started okay um, so first of all, thank you everyone uh, for having me today, and I wanted to give a special uh, shout out to uh, two, uh, two of my committee members that are uh, here in attendance, Dr. Grant and Dr. Hill. Um, they are awesome, and they were fantastic throughout this whole process. Um, but to really jump into this, um, my dissertation uh, was titled The Influence of the COVID-19 Pandemic on Stress in Students Enrolled in Advanced Academic Courses, a Multiple Case Study. So we're looking, when I mean academic courses, we're looking at AP courses, uh, IB courses that are um, some of the highest level classes that students can take in high school. All right, so um, I'm going to just kind of fly through um, most of my slides so I can spend most of the time talking about my results. Um, but the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, we have all lived through it. We know all about it. Um, you know, we, I think in a lot of areas in our lives and the lives of students and throughout schools, uh, we are still being impacted um, by the pandemic. Um, but basically, you know, it was hard. It was hard for us uh, and it was especially hard for students. Um, and students who are specifically enrolled in advanced academic courses, um, you know, there's research that shows, and there's not a lot of research, but there is research that shows that students enrolled in AP courses, IB courses tend to be more stressed than students enrolled in, you know, standard general educational classes. Um, and then let's throw in uh, the pandemic on top of that. So that led me to uh, my statement, a problem to be researched. So, you know, while there is some research, and there's not a lot, uh, that directly explores the effect of advanced academic courses on student stress, um, there is no research that has specifically explored the lived experiences of high school graduates who were previously enrolled in AP and IB courses during the COVID-19 pandemic. Therefore, more research is needed to understand what specific aspects of the pandemic uh, contributed to stress in high school graduates who are enrolled in advanced academic courses and in what ways they sought to address it. So uh, this was my purpose statement. You know, I wanted to better understand how the pandemic really shaped the lived experiences and stress of high school graduates. Um, and initially before the pandemic rolled around, uh, because I was a high school counselor, I was very interested in the impact of advanced academic courses uh, on stress levels for high school students. Uh, as a counselor, you know, I was always having students taking tons of AP courses, and they were always so stressed and overwhelmed. And so I was first really interested in kind of looking deeper into that because there wasn't really a lot of research on that topic. Uh, and then the pandemic happened. And then, you know, I was like, whoa, 
well, it's actually Dr. Grant um, who was like, hey, you know, let's look at the pandemic as well. And so it just was kind of perfect timing to really explore that and to kind of uh, put out some really cutting edge research as well. Um, so these were my research questions. You know, how do high school uh, graduates in the class of 2021 describe their lived experiences? Uh, what contributed to their stress? And then what helped mediate their stress uh, while completing advanced academic coursework? So I just want to touch really quickly on my literature review. Um, I had three streams of research, uh, three streams, and they were around the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on education, um, the constellation of factors contributing to adolescent stress, uh, which goes beyond just, you know, educational stressors, right? We're looking at environmental factors, psychological factors. We're looking at various, um, you know, traumatic events, um, just the whole um, array of factors that could contribute to adolescent stress. Uh, and then I looked really deeply into advanced academic programs and then how those programs, um, you know, possibly resulted in adolescent stress. So these were my participants uh, in my qualitative multiple case study. I had six participants. And, um, you know, I think looking back in something uh, in terms of my recommendations that I would have loved to have more. I think originally my target number was to have 10 participants in this study. Um, but given, you know, how long IRB can take, um, you know, I did not get to really start recruiting and working with my participants until they were actually uh, in their freshman year of college. Um, and that was a little bit tougher to schedule and to get participants recruited. Um, but I was very happy with the six participants because they were fantastic. Um, they were very open, flexible. Um, but I, I believe that I got a pretty diverse um, you know, group of participants who participated in this study. Um, in this chart, I did want to want to include some demographic information, uh, the number of AP and IB courses they were taking, um, also their extracurricular activities, because this was important in terms of their senior year to kind of give you a holistic understanding of, you know, what kind of students these were, um, what they were engaging in, um, you know, from a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and in addition to their household, right? And I didn't include pets on here, but that is also information I included as well, because, you know, during the pandemic, all these students were learning from home. And so to really get that big picture understanding of what that experience was like, learning from home, uh, you know, I also wanted to understand what else was happening, you know, and who, who were they taking care of their siblings? Did they have to take their dogs on a walk? All these other different factors. Um, and then another little area I wanted to highlight was the personal artifacts. You probably see Sharpie marker, bed, what does that mean? Um, and so I collected data through, um, various avenues. And one of them was um, through collecting personal artifacts and documents. And so I did have participants bring um, to our um, virtual interview an item that represented their senior year. Uh, and so if it wasn't COVID and, uh, you know, these participants were not remote and we we're meeting in person, uh, usually in a case study, you would have them bring it in person. I would take a picture and I'd make a beautiful collage to include in my research. Uh, but everything was virtual. So they, you know, they brought it they showed it, we talked more about it. And so uh, that was just something else that was, you know, kind of triangulated uh, into my data analysis. So research methods, um, I conducted a multiple case study. Uh, this was a qualitative uh, research design. And so basically a multiple case study consists of multiple cases, hence the name. Um, so basically what I did for my research specifically was um, each, individual participant, each high school graduate was considered a case. So I examined, you know, I met with them, I conducted various data analysis. Um, they were each in their own case. Um, and then basically for the multiple case study to take effect, you know, I reviewed uh, and analyzed data across the cases as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in my data analysis. Um, and one key aspect of multiple case study research is try the principle of triangulation. And so I was able to actually triangulate data from multiple uh, sources. And so 
I would say the kind of the meat and potatoes of my data came from uh, primary interviews. So I conducted initial interviews uh, and then follow-up interviews as well with my participants. And the follow-up interviews were uh, a little shorter and they were just a way to kind of validate my findings from the first interview uh, to kind of further clarify, ask additional questions. It was a way to kind of validate some of my um, kind of working theories that I had and summaries and so forth. Um, I also had the personal documents artifacts review where I asked them to bring an artifact that represented their senior year. And then I did um, provide them a brief background questionnaire that mostly connect, uh, mostly co collected um, demographic information. Um, but it was just nice to have that as well. And I didn't have to spend as much time during the interview kind of collecting that information. Um, let's see here. Got about 11 minutes. So data analysis. Um, so really what I wanted to highlight for my data analysis, and again, mostly for the interviews, um, was within case analysis and cross case analysis. So for multiple case study research, um, you would first conduct within case analysis. So I'm basically coding, going through all my transcripts for each individual case for each participant um, and, you know, coming up with working theories and various themes that are speaking to me for each case. And then uh, I would conduct cross case analysis, which would be basically um, looking for themes across the cases, looking for similarities and differences, uh, you know, amongst all the cases. Um, I use various coding methods, um, vivo, emotion, process, structural, descriptive. Um, definitely by the end of it, uh, I was like, maybe I did too much because it was extremely tedious. Um, but I will say, um, you know, I was able to, a lot of the same codes and themes were really speaking through, to me through each coding process. So it kind of in itself kind of validated what I was finding, which was helpful. Uh, it was just extremely tedious. Um, but again, you know, it really, I think, spoke to uh, the themes that, you know, were speaking to me and so forth. Um, document review, um, that was just another way, another source of data to be triangulated. Um, you know, data analysis for the surveys uh, just provided another layer to kind of better understand uh, my phenomenon and interest. So into my findings, um, I had three major themes that were identified from this study. So finding number one, uh, theme number one, described what it was like uh, to be a senior during the world during a worldwide pandemic. So I had various sub themes and, you know, all the participants talked about missed opportunities. They talked about modified events, um, you know, and I think one of my participants, Jessica, you know, summed it up really well. She was expecting her senior year to be uh, like the high school musical movies. And it wasn't like that. Right. And a lot of the participants talked about how, you know, because of the pandemic, um, you know, they weren't able to have the same experiences, same events uh, that they would normally have during the school year, especially during their senior year. So like we're talking about prom, homecoming, sports games, various club activities. Um, they weren't able to have some of those. Um, and if they did, they were modified. Um, you know, I remember them talking about prom, how they had to go at one, at one school, they had to come in shifts, everyone had to wear masks, and it just was not the same experience. And I think a lot of that kind of um, influenced kind of my second theme, uh, which was lost connections to being a senior. Um, my participants really did not feel connected to being a high school student. They didn't feel like a senior. Um, you know, Mary summed it up really well where she said, we kind of transcended past the whole high school thing. You know, I didn't have that connection to high school anymore. And I think for high school students, you know, when they're going through ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, they are looking forward to being seniors. Uh, and they did not have that connection um, to being a senior. But then on the flip side of all of this, uh, you know, it sounded all bad at first, but there was some positive takeaways um, from the pandemic. Um, you know, students did talk about that the pandemic and virtual learning did provide maximum flexibility um, for uh, good and bad. You know, Cindy shared that school started at 810. I would wake up at 809, you know, turn my laptop on and I'd be in school. So to some degree, it did provide more flexibility. Um, but then kind of going into my next theme, you know, it did provide a lot of um, disruptions and difficulties as well. So theme two um, described what it was like taking advanced academic classes during a worldwide pandemic. 
um, a lot of students talked about what it was like to be learning from home and the various distractions that they uh, faced, right? And so for Ben, uh, he talked about how it was really easy for him to play video games, um, to really not have to focus on his schoolwork uh, because he could turn his screen off, turn his microphone off um, and go do something else, right? And, you know, it was really important for teachers um, to make that experience for students. And so uh, my second sub theme was teachers make or break this experience. And this, you know, further shows that the efforts that teachers made um, to try to normalize the school year as best as they could really made a difference. And I had participants talk about, you know, they were so aware of when teachers weren't putting in that effort, weren't trying to make the best of the situation. And for those students, they didn't care either. You know, if the teachers weren't making an effort to make the best of that school year, students weren't either, right? And it really made a difference for those teachers who really just tried the best they could to make it a somewhat normal school year. And that really showed. And, you know, for these students, it was really important to them. Uh, and then, of course, uh, virtual learning was challenging. Uh, virtual learning was extremely uh, difficult for all my participants, um, especially not being able to get help, not being able to, you know, get help from their peers, from their teachers, uh, but then also from a social emotional standpoint as well. So beyond the academic impact that it made for these advanced academic students who are taking classes that move at, you know, a much quicker pace, that have much more rigor, um, this really impacted the social emotional learning development for students as well, where they weren't able to socialize with their peers. Um, you know, students did not have to keep their camera or microphone on. And so a lot of times students felt like they were talking to a wall. They'd be put in a group and people would not respond. They would not, they were unable to get to know their classmates and so forth. So that was a huge challenge as well. Theme number three, um, you know, described the various sources of stress that students experienced uh, during their senior year and during the pandemic, and then uh, the various sources of support that they had had as well. Um, you know, my first sub theme in this category was in this theme was basically there was various degrees of stress, right? And so, to the you know, I think the highest extreme where Jessica was so stressed out she just stopped going to school altogether. Uh, to a participant like Peter who actually thought it lightened his stress. And what's actually interesting about Peter is Peter took uh, six AP courses and he actually found the pandemic made life a little easier because he was able to multitask and actually work on homework and other assignments uh, during his classes during the school day because he would just turn his mic off, turn his camera off and just get as much done as possible. Um, but there is very varying degrees of stress. And I would say that for the most part, um, you know, all the students were stressed, um, but definitely my four female students were uh, much more stressed uh, in general than my two male students. And that's going to be uh, something we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, my second sub theme was that there was various sources of stress, right? And so, you know, Jessica talked about the college application process, but not only are we talking about college up the college application process that occurs during senior year, um, academic stress, not being able to get help in some of the more challenging courses, but there is also, um, you know, stress going on with the pandemic, right? Um, fear of family members getting sick. Um, there was, this was during a time that there was a lot of political unrest. Um, and so there was all sorts of different stressors that were really making an impact on my participants. Uh, and then the last sub theme was sources of support. Uh, and this is basically where a lot of participants talked about there was always someone uh, or something they could turn to to manage their support, right? So uh, whether it's family members, peers, classmates, um, you know, students did feel that they were able to, to some degrees mitigate that stress, um, you know, and also being able to engage in physical exercise and activities. So playing basketball, lifting weights. Um, and as we know, there's tons of research that, you know, further supports that. So my results and interpretations, um, you know, result one, learning from home presented its fair share of challenges. Um, it was tough for my participants to learn from home. Uh, and there is uh, other research that, you know, further validates that um, as well. And I'm based on time, I want to kind of fly through these. 
uh, re uh, result two, um, the circumstances of the pandemic left participants isolated at home with fewer opportunities to socialize and develop relationships with peers due to minimal classroom engagement uh, during the school day and canceled and our modified school events. And so this was a, a big one and, and really resonated with me as uh, a former school counselor because, you know, I really saw uh, kind of the social emotional impact that this the pandemic had on students, not only the academic impact, but just being able to make connections, being able to meet other people, um, you know, and again, senior year is usually related to, um, you know, all these great things happening, finish school, you know, finishing the school year, graduating, and everything was modified or canceled. It, it was, you know, their senior year really did not live up to those expectations. Um, result three, the college application process was the primary source of immense stress uh, for many of the participants. Um, yeah, this was pretty evident amongst all the participants. They really talked about how challenging uh, the college application process was, and not only the process itself, uh, completing FAFSA, um, but also just the inability to go visit a college, to go get a college tour, to do appropriate research um, on um, on college and the various options that they had. Uh, and then result number four, there was apparent gender differences um, and how participants described their stress levels and sense of connection to their senior year. Um, so I would definitely say that the, my female participants definitely had a, uh, a bit more of a challenging time um, during their senior year than the two male participants in my study. So conclusions. Um, so how do high school graduates in the class of 2021 describe their lived experiences? Um, you know, it presented numerous challenges to their learning, their daily routines and relationships. Um, and, you know, these this is really important because these are students who got to really miss out on rich learning opportunities, right? AP courses, IB courses, uh, these are the most rigorous, challenging courses, you know, available in schools and students were not able to really get the most out of those classes. Um, and, you know, they were really negatively impacted by the decline in peer participation and teacher engagement. Uh, research question number two, what contributed to their stress? Um, I would say a plethora of factors contributed to, to their stress. Um, not only was there's an application piece, the college application piece, the academic piece, uh, but really, you know, specifically focus on the pandemic, um, fears of contracting the virus. Um, there's an added level of tragedy. I had participants talk about losing family members, um, you know, difficulties with the virtual school setting and so forth. And I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to just fly through these. Uh, research question number three, what helped mediate their stress? Um, you know, being able to manage their stress through various systems of support and participating in healthy activities. Um, and recommendations, I'll just pick one for each. Uh, recommendations for practice, um, you know, I would say that being able to provide more opportunities uh, for students to safely socialize during and after school uh, and really being able to focus on the kind of the social emotional learning and development for students, uh, because I think that really goes hand in hand with, um, you know, academic learning. Um, and then for future research, um, I would have loved to uh, conduct a bigger study uh, and maybe had some more participants. And I thought it would also be interesting, not only having more participants, um, but looking at possibly, you know, uh, marginalized groups of students, looking at students who are enrolled in general educational classes and seeing if there was a difference between those students and students enrolled in advanced academic courses. Uh, and then maybe looking at the experiences of uh, the educators, right? Looking at school counselors, looking at teachers and looking, uh, you know, because as a uh, school educator, you know, I would hear from uh, other staff members how challenging it was, but to really be able to collect hard data, um, you know, from them their, themselves. Uh, but that is it. So thank you very much. And I'll open it up to Q&A. Thank you so much, Sam, for that. Uh, what a timely research topic that I'm sure will continue to be relevant here. Um, at this point, we'll take questions uh, from our attendees. Again, you can type them in the chat or on mic. Oh, I just looked at the notes. Did you guys actually see my slides or was it the presenter view? We did see your slides and your notes, but it was- Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I didn't see that until after. Sorry about that.
Well, I'll ask a question, uh, Sam. So if you were to follow up with these participants, you know, in the next couple of years or even more long term, what kinds of questions would you have for them in terms of the longer term effects of their experiences based on what you found in this study? Uh yeah, great question. I think um, I would want to know more about kind of, I think, well, there's a few things. I think really looking at possibly any academic gaps. And so because they weren't getting that enriching um, experience their senior year in these advanced academic courses and in their coursework as a whole, um, being able to see that now that they've transitioned to college, um, was there any apparent gaps, right? Especially looking at maybe they were taking AP biology, AP psychology to better prepare themselves as a bio major or as a psychology major, and maybe not being able to get that same level of coursework in high school, did that make an impact while they're in college, um, and so forth. So I think there's one part about the academic piece, but then also about um, the social piece. And so something that did come up in my conversations um, was that a lot of participants when they were in college kind of felt that they lost a lot of the ability to be able to connect with people in person and kind of those peer social skills. And because they were so used to looking at a blank screen, they were so used to um, not socializing, being isolated, um, and that they did talk about, like, I don't know how to talk to people. Right. And so it would be interesting now at this point, now that we're a few years away to kind of see if that's still an issue. Uh, has that gotten better uh, and what that was like for all the participants? Any other questions? Okay, well, I'd like to thank our presenters, Monica and Sam, for presenting today. I would like to thank all of you as well for attending the colloquium event series. The next colloquium event will be held on the first Friday of April, which is April 7th from 12 to 1 Eastern time zone, and we hope you can join us.